join me in the pledge to officially start our meeting? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could have the consent of the other commissioners, I'm going to move the public participation part up after our first presentation. Is that all right? Okay. Before we start our session this morning, I want to remind everyone that we have three presentations. Uh, once all three presentations are completed, there we're going to move the public portion up after the first one, and then we'll have one at the end. Uh, during presentations, there will be no questions or comments from the audience, and if the media would like to conduct interviews following any of the presentations, we have designated an area just outside the rear entrance of the building. Please don't stop in the hallway, as this may distract the remainder of our session. Thanks for your understanding. We'll get started with the first item here, which is a presentation, Professional Soccer Sports Development Opportunity for City of Melford. FC Cincinnati, Claremont Convention Visitors Bureau. Who's going to get started? <clears throat> Claremont County, Claremont County Commissioners, I, on behalf of Mayor Fred Albrecht and the Milford City Council, I want to express our sincere appreciation for you all allowing us talk to you today about an exciting opportunity uh, for the city of Milford and Claremont County. So thank you, commissioners, for uh, allowing us to speak. Uh, I am here again on behalf of the city of Milford uh, to discuss an opportunity uh, that we have for not only the city but for Claremont County. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we got to this point, Come on. Okay. kind of the genesis of, of soccer in Milford. So about a year ago, uh, we were approached uh, about an opportunity from uh, FC Cincinnati to bring a soccer training facility and academy uh, to Claremont County. Uh, we looked at several sites that we had as an inventory in the city of Milford. Uh, we found one site in particular that we thought would be a great fit for the club. Uh, throughout the several months after that, we had discussions with the club in this particular piece of property. Uh, over a period of time, that didn't work out. So we were left to assess the rest of our inventory. And the one site that we came up with that we thought would be a perfect fit was Expressway Park in, in Milford. Um, our sales pitch was simple. Uh, we knew that we were competing with other, other municipalities and other counties. Our sales pitch was, others will have you, but we want you. We want you. And that was important. And yes, that's a simple sales pitch. Because not only was it economic development, but we wanted to be part of something exciting that FC Cincinnati was doing in the greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area. We wanted to attach ourselves to that because we believed in what they were doing and what they, what they were trying to accomplish. Um, so we engaged the Expressway Park folks. Uh, we had conversations with them early on. We didn't even mention FC Cincinnati. We talked to them about their business. Um, we had a fortunate opportunity with them that they were looking to sell a business and retire. So. We talked to FC Cincinnati. Uh, we said, how about Expressway Park? We had some early discussions with them. We knew what they were looking for based off of the, the prior site that we were, we were pitching to them. Uh, and then we married the two together, uh, the Expressway owners and FC Cincinnati as, as the city working in, in a conduit and in concert with that. Um, and when what we have today kind of culminates in all of those discussions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the intangibles of Expressway Park and how we believe that attracted the club to Milford and Claremont County. This site provides adequate coverage for the club. This site provides a suburban setting away from heavy congestion and high density. The site will provide visibility for the club from a major interstate exchange with direct accessibility. The site is located on the east side of Cincinnati, which enables the club to fully provide soccer presence in the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. By encompassing the entire tri-state area, the west side stadium, and east side soccer training facility and soccer academy, the entire local FC Cincinnati fan base is captured and marketed. 
The site is already in a functioning athletic complex and is already zoned to accommodate sports. And again, as I mentioned, the property was available for sale and business owners, business owners were looking to retire. <coughs> Our Cl Milford Claremont County tangibles. Uh, this area is growing exponentially. You can see that in Union Township, Miami Township, Batavia, City of Milford. Um, more individuals, families, and businesses in the tri-state area are migrating or establishing businesses in Claremont County. This site is prime real estate. Location, again, is with an easy access of 275, which provides the club with the availability to cover end-to-end -end the greater Cincinnati and northern Kentucky area. US 50, or Columbia Parkway, provides an alternative access directly to downtown Cincinnati and the club stadium on the west side of Cincinnati. In addition, this location is a, is a pipeline feeder for State Route 28, State Route 131, State Route 126, and important close proximity to State Route 32. Uh, next slide, please. FC Cincinnati uh, to Major League Soccer. As we all know, it took just over two years in existence, and this is a testament to FC Cincinnati and why we want to capture that excitement. Two years of existence. FC Cincinnati was accepted into Major League Soccer May 29, 2018, and they will begin league play in 2019. The club is expected to have a stadium complete in less than two years and the soccer training facility and academy by mid-2019. How is this important to us? How is this important to Milford and Claremont County? The international exposure and economic development opportunities we feel are endless. Soccer is a fast-growing sport in the United States and is a global juggernaut institution on the international stage. According to FIFA, there are 234 international soccer teams and a close to a billion people either view televised games or attend soccer games annually. The exposure of having Major League Soccer franchise soccer operations in Claremont County is immeasurable and provides tremendous economic opportunity for international companies to conduct future business in our local economies. The Major League franchise in Milford and Claremont County, the Soccer Training Academy will provide a $30 million investment for, lo for the local economies. The impact presence of the club will benefit several local economies by providing hotel lodging, multiple retail shopping, and restaurant eateries. Also, housing and health care services will be enhanced and will generate millions of dollars for Claremont County, Union Township, Milford, and Miami Township businesses in particular. Presently, there are 23 major league soccer teams in league play. FC Cincinnati, as mentioned, will join the league with two other teams, Nashville and Miami, in a couple of years. This will bring the total MS, MLS teams to 26, with more expansion additions to follow the next several years. Claremont County will be one of only 26 counties in the United States and Canada to have major league soccer franchise training facility and soccer academy in our own backyards. This will include other communities in MLS, such as Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Seattle, Houston, Atlanta, Toronto, and Vancouver, to name a few. There are now eight professional sports franchises in the state of Ohio. Of those eight, seven of those professional sports franchises have their training facilities in three counties, Hamilton, Franklin, and Cuyahoga counties. The opportunity of an FC Cincinnati to construct a world-class training facility and soccer academy will add Claremont County to this exclusive list in the state. As previously noted, the development opportunity will provide $30 million investment in facilities, including a 30,000 square foot main building for the first team, multiple soccer pitches, and a small stadium venue to host other major league teams' practices. The club's academy and developmental teams will also be included. The state-of-the-art facility will be a crown jewel for MLS for player recruiting and franchise development and will add approximately 50 to 60 jobs to the Claremont County economy. Earlier this month, FIFA announced that the United States, Mexico, and Canada will be hosting the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Cincinnati is a finalist to host early rounds of, World, of the World Cup tournament. If selected, cup teams from other countries around the world, for example, Germany, Spain, 
Italy, Brazil, and France, to name a few, will converge on Cincinnati for the games. A training facility in Claremont County will likely be a site to host team practices and lodge their players and staff during the early rounds. This will also include international media and press coverage that will converge on our communities and allow Claremont County to share our story. International exposure and marketing like this for our county would be unprecedented. FC Cincinnati Soccer Academy will be home to the club's youth development teams. These teams will compete with other MLS youth development teams which will travel to the facility to engage in matches. The traveling teams will come to our area from other MLS cities and bring additional revenue to support our surrounding township friends and villages. The already existing and thriving youth soccer presence will provide the club with the opportunity to establish direct accessibility, partnerships, and relationship with, with youth programs and associations such as Kings Hammer, Cincinnati United Soccer, Alliance Cincinnati, Cincinnati Elite FC, Cincy SC, and Soccer Association for Youth. The presence in Claremont County of the club will benefit several private businesses and the services that they provide. Businesses such as Olympic Fields in Batavia and Cincy Sports Nation in Miami Township, as well as other school districts such as West Claremont and Milford, could partner with FC Cincinnati to provide youth camps and expand on already existing and established local youth leagues and tournaments. Friendlies between the club's development teams and high school soccer teams are also a possibility. I'm saying early on, Milford and Claremont County bought into FC Cincinnati, and today with the presentations you're going to hear, F Cincinnati has bought into Milford and Claremont County. And with that, I'm going to introduce Mr. Jeff Birdie, Jeff is the president and general manager of FC Cincinnati. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Commission President Humphrey, Commissioners Painter and Ubel, County officials, uh, Mayor Albrecht and our, our Milford officials, thank you all for giving us the opportunity uh, this morning to join with you to share our exciting vision for FC Cincinnati. It's good to be back in, in Claremont County. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago where I was the president of King's Hammer working with the Rubel family to do the deal at Red Barn to bring Olympic Fields and create that wonderful development. So it's no surprise that as we created FC Cincinnati, uh, one of the first uh, thoughts in terms of developing a training complex, a world-class facility uh, was here in, in Claremont County. Um, when we created FC Cincinnati uh, to bring the world's biggest sport uh, to our region, we had three pillars. Uh, we were going to be a winning team, we were going to be a family-friendly club, and we were going to be a franchise that was visible uh, in our commitment uh, to our community, to our region. Uh, and we think that those pillars have uh, been the cornerstones to our success in really allowing our supporters to create the club from scratch. Uh, there was no question that while we were entering the league in a lower division, the goal was always Major League Soccer. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, those exceptional goals, we knew that we would need to build a world-class uh, training facility to support not only our values, uh, but also our vision for the future. Uh, if you're going to be a winning team, uh, if you're going to be family-friendly, uh, and if you're going to be visible and committed in the community, your training facility is going to have a lot to say about your values. Uh, does the facility have what you need to de develop a winning team uh, and carry the pride of our region on the playing field? Uh, is it family friendly? We're going to have kids uh, in our youth academy. Some will be driving after 16. Some will be younger. Their parents. Are we an accessible place that families can get to? Or are they always going to be scratching their heads, fighting through rush hour traffic to try to get their children uh, to, to practice? And then are we going to be visible uh, and committed in the community? Is it an area where we can bring youth tournaments? Is it an area where we can bring economic development? Is, there an, is this where we can bring vitality to the region to leverage what we hope is an enormous investment from us and to do good for the community? And so in, in the search for this world-class training facility, we benchmarked the expansion team that was sort of just out there as we began our journey, and that was Atlanta United. 
And we had an opportunity through the Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, to go down to Atlanta in 2016 to see a world-class facility. And that sort of gave us, wow, if that's, if that's what it's going to take, if we want to be exceptional, uh, we now know what our standards uh, need to be. And so with that, we worked with Michael Schuster and Associates, uh, a, a strong uh, leading re uh, uh, architecture firm here in greater Cincinnati, to, to do site uh, preparation, site review. Where could we build this facility? Uh, 15 to 20 acres needed to be relatively flat, needed to be uh, available for sale, uh, needed to be in an area that was accessible to families, uh, that would be visible, that people could easily find. Uh, uh, we did a heat map to see, we w reached out to all the top clubs in, in the area to say, hey, you're very top teams where they, a lot of the kids are going to college and playing college soccer. What are their zip codes? And so we did a heat map to see where those families currently existed. Obviously, we know we want to continue to grow the sport, but at least for now, we wanted to have an idea. And, and it, it appeared to us that uh, sort of the eastern, northeastern area uh, and south were really strong. And so we then went about doing reviews of all kinds of sites in Hamilton County, as you would imagine, Butler County, Warren County, Claremont County here, as well as the counties in, in Northern Kentucky uh, to get a, a, an, an assessment of what options might be out there. And, and as was noted by uh, Michael Doss, this isn't just about FC Cincinnati. Our long-term vision is to bring the World Cup here uh, and have the opportunity to world-class, literally world-class teams, best players in the world, training at our facility uh, in 2026 as a part of the World Cup. So clearly our standards were gonna be uh, very, very high. So um, as we went through it, we started to develop, um, in, as, as was indicated, the opportunity to develop uh, Expressway Park, and we started to put together a, a site plan uh, and the site plan, uh, again, under the leadership of Michael Schuster and Associates, uh, shows how it'll have our first team building, so that'll be the professional players. It'll have an academy uh, building with locker rooms for younger kids and their teams, probably a little bit more pedestrian at the lower ages, and then with step up in the quality of, of the facilities to, as they take their journey to become in with the ultimate goal of getting into that first team building. Uh, we'll have a, a stadium field with some grandstands so that as, ki as, as families come with their kids or for some of the tournaments that we have in the county already to the championship game to be able to be uh, at the, uh, at the uh, professional facility. Obviously, a building and grounds facility, cutting the grass will get very important for us, right? Uh, and all the landscaping uh, and equipment. And then associated parking uh, and, and, and other elements. So we do have some uh, renderings here to share with you. I want to acknowledge uh, Betty and Bob Owens and the Dixon family uh, who were willing to partner uh, with uh, Milford and the Convention of Visitors Bureau and FC Cincinnati, and also Dale uh, and Nancy Rowe, uh, who uh, again came to the table to try to allow this vision uh, to take place. So you, you can see the building. Uh, it, 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 we, we believe it's an attractive building. Uh, that will be inviting to families, be inviting to our players. You know, in, in sports, recruitment's a big part of it, right? We're recruiting free agents. We're recruiting players from in, in our sport, not only across the United States, but from Argentina and from uh, Europe and other parts of the world to come and say this would be a great place to train. I had the opportunity to go see the facilities uh, at Chelsea and Tottenham Spurs uh, and Aston Villa in Team England uh, and some of the top clubs in, in the Netherlands. This will measure up with those kinds of facilities. You can see we take a lot of uh, care on the landscaping and the grounds to make sure, again, that it is uh, inviting. You can see how the, the, the parking would be nestled in, again, uh, around attractive landscaping. I asked for blue flowers. They look a little purple to me, but my friends from Elder think that that's all right. So you can see the, 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 the landscaping is trying to represent as best we can our, our blue and orange brand. 
So it's a two-story building. You can see on the back side, this would be um, a rendering of the uh, academy field where games would be held. You can see that there's some grandstand there, a balcony for our coaches to be able to step out and watch the academy players uh, as they train. Uh, this shows the layout. Again, you can see sort of right in the dead center, the larger building is the first team building. And then to the left, you see there's an academy building. Uh, the training shed is all the way in uh, sort of towards the lower left. You see one turf field, two natural grass fields, and then a goalkeeper area uh, that's in the uh, lower right of, of the training complex. Uh, you can see um, 275 is going to be uh, coming in on the uh, right. It's a little bit off the page. Uh, and you can see... Um, the, the main drive there uh, on the far left, and then, of course, uh, 50 up top. So uh, this will support our, our MLS team. Uh, clearly, uh, the Youth Academy is a big piece. I was on WLW earlier this morning, and Scott Sloan was asking, so this is like um, the Reds with their uh, Urban Youth Academy. And I said, similar, except for the Reds practice, the players practice at the ballpark, their Urban Youth Academy is, is in the Bond Hill Roselawn area. We're putting them all together in, in one site. Uh, so uh, in soccer, you're, we have a couple players right now from Cincinnati that play for FC. What a great opportunity for kids to grow up. I mean, I knew I grew up playing, wanting to play for the Big Red Machine. I was never that good. But the goals of wanting to be a professional baseball player always guided me and pushed me and the goals from sports are brilliant lessons and 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 the youth academy is a big piece of that for us to try to develop players to be on our first team but using that work to sort of put people on a great path uh, for life we're going to have tournaments and showcases uh, you have a lot of brilliant tournaments already here uh, as i mentioned i got to be a part of one of them and bringing the um, blue chip showcase from king's hammer to Claremont County and Olympic Fields. I've coached many times at Dog Days at Finley Ray when I was coaching my kids. So we look forward to partnering uh, with those existing events to see how we can grow them. And, and then also may, maybe partnering to use some events that we will sponsor where we partner with those fields as well beyond just this training center. We're gonna, we're gonna invest up to $30 million in the new training center. That's on top of the 150 that we had to pay MLS and probably about $250 million that we're gonna spend on our stadium. So clearly we're making a massive legacy investment uh, in our sport and in our club and what it represents for our region. This shows a little bit uh, about, uh, as we sort of see over the next two to three years, growing out a uh, tournament uh, and game uh, program where you can see at the top, our academies will be multiple teams uh, and those teams will host games against other MLS Development Academy teams. Uh, that's at the top. And then uh, below that, you see the college showcase and then some uh, 3v3, which is a really big deal with our kids these days and learning their foot skills, high school showcases, youth tournaments, and, and adult 7v7 uh, events. I think once you get to be our age, 11v11 seems like a lot of running, so 7v7 seems a, a lot easier. So um, at the end here, um, why Milford and Claremont County? Um, I want to stress again, we looked all over the region. I mean, we literally, we knew from the moment we started FC that we were going to need to build a, a training facility. We have a great opportunity to be training at Nippert right now um, on the turf, um, and, and it's a great opportunity now as we grow the franchise, but long term, we knew we would need this kind of facility. And so over two and a half years, we really have looked exhaustively throughout the region, and we feel that our uh, opportunity here uh, is the perfect answer uh, to our future. It has the sufficient acreage. It has a, a, a very uh, attractive suburban setting. It's obviously flat. It's recreational already. Uh, and it's accessible to us quickly. That's the part I want to stress. We're going to be a, an MLS team practicing here in about 37 weeks. So we don't have a whole lot of time. So we look forward to getting this done quickly so that literally our, t our players, when they arrive January 1, we immediately have a, a field for them to train on. We've been working with moats uh, over the past um, few months, and we literally are already growing the grass field that's going to come in here uh, to support the first team 
it'll be it would be planted in the early fall so that it's ready to be played on uh, in 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 January. Uh, obviously, we'll have some indoor depending on our weather that we have here. But the goal would be to have this available immediately. Obviously, we'll have some temporary facilities in terms of locker and whatnot, and then the building would be open come July. Uh, so th this meets all of our criteria. Uh, as was stated by Michael, the accessibility from I-275 and, and US-50 is critical. Again, just think of parents, and, and as a soccer parent, I, I always thought of this. I'm driving my children to train at FC Cincinnati. How am I going to get there? How long is it going to take? They have schoolwork. They have homework. I may have other kids. How do I balance all that? We may have kids coming from Dayton, Ohio, that area coming down. We may have kids from uh, northern Kentucky and at least a little southern of northern Kentucky coming up. Uh, we may have kids coming from the west side. Uh, and so the, the, the accessibility to this site and visibility where they can get right off the highway and they know that they're there is enormously attractive. Uh, and then lastly, just the partnerships that this affords us. Uh, Matt Van Sant, the president and CEO of the Claremont uh, Chamber of Commerce is here. The business community has been outstanding. Some of the hotel uh, GMs and owners have been enormously supportive. And then of course, uh, the youth clubs, the recreational piece, and then of course our government officials. So this is a collective vision and we really look forward to partnering with you to continue to grow Claremont County in what we believe is a very exciting way. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, I'm Jeff morning. Blom. I'm the president of the Claremont County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, Commissioners uh, Painter, Humphreys, and Eubel, thank you very much for allowing us to present this morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the role of the, the Convention and Visitors Bureau and why the Convention and Visitors Bureau is involved. Um, you know, our mission as an organization, we're a professional uh, destination marketing and sales organization. And, and our, our role in the county is to bring in more visitors, overnight stays, and increase visitor spending in the county. And that's our primary mission. Uh, as far as in, in capturing in, in our goals for that mission, we certainly concentrate on the sports market. Uh, the sports market is, is huge in Claremont County. It's one of the biggest drivers of hotel room nights uh, here in Claremont County. And as such, the CVB partners with, with many different youth uh, sports tournaments and organizations, uh, as well as, as adult tournaments. Um, we bring in a variety of different events to the county, uh, from, from U.S. rowing and Midwest regatta championships at East Fork State Park, uh, to, we brought in a cornhole championship recently to Cincy Sports Nation, helped utilize their new facilities, um, bringing, bringing in events to Olympic Fields here in Batavia, um, but a variety of different sports venues through the county. And our goal is to bring in more tournaments, more events to all these facilities, partner with them, and, and bring in and more visitors to our county, more overnight stays, and more visitor spending, which has a huge positive impact uh, on all of our municipalities here in the county. Um, as such, uh, this project certainly had a great appeal and bringing in a world-class uh, Major League Soccer sports facility uh, to our county uh, is very appealing on, on a variety of different levels. Um, as such, in order for us to really move forward with any type of development and any type of CBB backing, we really had to go back and, and really conduct some research. So we, we partnered with the Sports Facility Advisory. We hired them to conduct research. They're, they're based in Clearwater, Florida. And, and their, their focus is mainly on, on sports facilities and venues in the United States and probably abroad as well. Um, the research that they performed, um, they, they sent us a report last month and uh, certainly came back very, very positive. And I'll discuss some of the research with you. I get some of the uh, non-fluffy uh, numbers, but these numbers to me are very exciting and very positive. And, and I hope you see the, all, all the positive in, in these as well. Um, Non-local days in the market, and let me just define that. Non-local is any visitor coming from more than 90 miles away. Okay, so there, there are visitors that are, that are coming in, not in Claremont County and not really in the general area of greater Cincinnati. Um, so you're looking at almost 65,000 visitors coming into uh, Claremont County uh, overall. And they did this, the SFA did this in two pieces. 
Uh, they focused on the practice facility as well as the overall area, bringing in uh, and partnering with a number of different tournaments and showcases, and, as well as the, uh, the FCC uh, Soccer Academy. So with the practice facility alone, just visitors to that facility, you know, players, parents, uh, you know, visiting teams, um, will be over 18,000. So you're looking at close to 18,500. So that's pretty exciting numbers. Room nights, however, is, is even, even more attractive to us because they're spending at a higher level. They're staying with us uh, more time. And, and those dollars are, are getting spent uh, throughout the community, uh, throughout Claremont, especially along the beltway of 275 with uh, Union Township, Miami Township, and Milford. And, and they'll be spending it areas, in other areas as well. Um, but the room nights projected just for the practice facility alone are almost 7,000 room nights annually. That is a huge number, and it does have a huge impact on the number of hotels that we have in Claremont County. We have 12 hotels currently, uh, the bulk of those being in Union Township. Uh, this will affect all of those hotels from Union Township, Milford, all the way up to uh, the Hilton Garden Inn off of Ward's Corner Road. Uh, so this, this will be a very nice positive impact for all of those hotels, especially during that spring, summer, and fall playing seasons. Um, in addition, uh, SFA conducted the research to show that in the future, and this is not going to happen in 2019, so it does, everything doesn't happen just overnight, um, they're built, you know, FC is going to build up those relationships and build those tournaments uh, and showcases, and the overall room nights are a little over 17,800. Okay, so uh, that, is, that is a huge number of room nights. Um, that, that will have an impact beyond Claremont County. Uh, so those will help fill room nights in, in adjacent counties as well. So you're looking at Warren County, Hamilton County, even Northern Kentucky counties, besides Claremont. Um, this could possibly spur some more hotel development in the future um, with a number of corporations that are looking at Claremont and a uh, new SC world-class uh, sports complex and, and soccer academy. You know, this could drive some more corporate uh, development as well as the hotel and, and tourism-related business. So we're very, very excited about that. Uh, to get into a little bit more of the visitor spending, um, lodging was based on 3.5 people per room for tournaments. So you're looking at you, typically two parents and a couple of kids in each room. Might be one parent and three kids. And probably sorry for that, right? Um, but you know they're they're spending money in a variety of different areas. So they'll be spending money in the hotels. So you're looking at approximately $28.51 on average per night in hotels, um, and that's per person. Uh, dining and groceries. So they'll be spending money at Jungle Gyms. They'll be spending money at Kroger to stock their rooms with snacks and drinks. Uh, they'll be going out and dining in our local restaurants, you know, whether, you know, whether that is, uh, you know, Padrino's in Milford or Chipotle or McDonald's or, or Longhorn Steakhouse down at, in the Eastgate area, or m maybe they drive down and enjoy a, a meal on the river at Front Street Cafe in New Richmond. Um, but there's a variety of, of different dining destinations that all of our visitors will enjoy. Transportations, they're going to fill up their gas tanks. They're going to fill up their gas tanks when they get here. If they're traveling from far away, they're going to fill up their gas tanks on departure to make sure they get home and have enough gas in the tank to get there. Uh, entertainment and attractions, they're going to be spending money. Uh, scene 75 in Milford, they'll be going down to the Cincinnati Nature Center if they like to hike in the outdoors, visit our state park. Uh, and obviously, they're going to, to travel and enjoy the regional attractions such as the Cincinnati Zoo, you know, Newport Aquarium, Kings Island, and of course enjoy our major league sports during the summer season, Cincinnati Reds, and obviously an FC Cincinnati game, okay? Um, in addition, they're going to shop. Shopping is the number one related activity when it comes to travel. Everybody shops, and that's one that uh, hopefully we'll see, you know, some of our independent boutique shop owners, some of our retail shops at Eastgate Mall uh, and other corridors we'll see a jump in, in business because of visitors to our county due to this facility. Um, the academy as well, it, and that's really geared based on the teams visiting, and these are your, your youth teams, U15, 17, 19, coming to this future FC soccer academy. So basically that's based on two people per room and with the thought that mostly their expenditures are going to be on lodging and, and dining. They're, the team's going to eat while they're here and they're going to sleep here. And other than that, they're pretty much playing soccer. But in addition, there will probably be some incremental expenditures in other areas, but SFA didn't really go into uh, trying to measure, measure that aspect of it. Okay. 
So economic impact, and, and this is really where we, we you know, get down to the total. Um, the practice facility alone is anticipated to generate $1.6 million, which is a very impressive number. And then when you add in the tournaments and, and all the showcases and, and future activity around the FC soccer uh, uh, training complex and, and sports academy, you're looking at an overall number of almost $6.8 million. Which is, which is a fantastic number. And we're very, very excited about that. And we're excited about that being spent you know, primarily here in Claremont County. Um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Komodeka. Well, as you can tell, Jeff gets very excited when he's talking about the numbers and the tourists that are going to come to our community because quite frankly that's the goal of our organization the convention and visitors bureau is designed to strengthen our community and it strengthens our community by creating economic development last time i checked 6.8 million dollars of annual direct spending is some pretty significant economic development for any county but specifically our county here and so today we're here to ask the commissioners for the tools that we need to welcome FC into our community because when I think of community I think of a feeling of fellowship with others because we have a common goal and I heard Jeff's Jeff Birding speak earlier and he was talking about one of the pillars one of the pillars of their organization is to create community it fits with the goals that we have here in Claremont County and we have common goals and we have folks that are interested in this development and creating that type of economic development. In the packets that we provided to you, you'll find letters of support from some of the hoteliers, some of our biggest hoteliers. In fact, I think Nick Baker from the Holiday Inn, the GM, is in the back. There's a letter from him in there for Homewood Suites and uh, the Hilton Garden Inn in Miami Township and City of Milford. We have that type of buy-in. We have that type of responsibility to create that economic development. I myself am a small business owner, not in Milford, not in Miami Township. I support this wholeheartedly because it's good for the county. If it's good for the county, it's good for every community within our county. I met, had the opportunity to meet with the owner of Padrino's and, and 20 Bricks last night, and to see the excitement that he had with this opportunity coming to his community was both very real and important to him and the city of Milford. So the purpose of what our presentation here today is, we'll go right to the purpose, is to ask the county commissioners to support our efforts by drafting a resolution increasing the lodging tax from 6% to 7% with that additional 1% that would be generated will be conveyed to the CVB because that's what's required and then will be turned over immediately to the city of Milford with the caveat that that 1% is used for the sole purpose of paying on this debt for the land. I get excited when I hear this type of information. If we go to the next slide, this is the, the legislation that provides the commissioners with the opportunity to institute this 1% tax. So that's what we're here to ask, that you implement this legislation and implement it by drafting a resolution consistent with the legislation this project will not happen without that 1%. This is our, our inclusion into the deal. And this is the only project, quite frankly, that meets the legislative requirements that were in the prior slide. And I think it is important to note that almost all of the extra 1% tax will be paid by non-Claremont County residents. It'll be visitors to our community. And quite frankly, the goal of FC of Claremont County CVB and others is that we have more visitors in our community, leaving more dollars in our community, creating more opportunities for new hotels in our community. So there is a significant return on investment for this public-private partnership. I believe in these public-private partnerships and I think they make a difference in our community. This is one of them. So with all due respect, we ask that that legislation be drafted and put into place as soon as practical. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jim, on the, I guess, are we taking questions at this point? Or is there somebody else? I can ask, I can answer a question. Um, the 1% goes toward the purchase of the property, right? Correct. Um, I guess who would own the property and is FC paying rent on the property? 
those are the details that I, I don't have all the answers to that right now. I don't have the, uh, that's all with the attorneys. But the property would not be owned by FC Cincinnati. Okay. I mean, the goal is that it would ultimately be owned by the Port Authority, which is another one of the tools available to create this type of economic development. It's Michael may have more information on that or. That's fine. Uh, to, to Perfect. So it sounds like it was kind of like the original deal. Correct. I mean, things hadn't changed. It's still the Port Authority. Okay. Yes. Uh, commissioners, my name is Dick Spore with Keating, Muthing, and Clee Camp in Cincinnati. And I'm the attorney for the team. Uh, if I might take a minute to answer your question, the land and the facility will be owned by the Claremont County Port Authority. Uh, it will be leased back to the team for a period of 30 years. Uh, the team will pay uh, a <clears throat> minimal amount of rent on the land because it will be paying a large amount of debt service for its stadium. So the land will be, there'll be a, a ground lease back to the, the team. Okay. And in the, the Port Authority is necessary in that equation to hold the, the title to the property. The CVB, of course, as you just heard, is necessary because of the, the tax money. And the city is necessary because in their uh, kindness and wisdom, they're issuing the bonds and spearheading the activity. Okay. Good. Are there any other legal questions? The, the boring part, I'll be glad to answer it now or, or later if the, you uh, contracts will be completed because I think we've said that, or at least I've said that uh, we need to see the contracts, understand the detail of it before I can make a decision about whether to move the tax forward or not. Sure. And the, there's, as you might expect in any enterprise this large, there'll be a series of agreements, but the, the focal or central agreement, which has been circulated very recently, is what's called a cooperative agreement. And that cooperative agreement, as it connotes, is among the team, the city of Milford, yourselves, the CVB and the Port Authority. So it's a, it's a large cooperative agreement and it describes what each party will be doing or will, will hope to be doing. And that, that agreement contains all of the terms. And of course it involves other agreements later such as a resolution to do the tax or the actual lease. There's a number, number of, of related documents but that is the focal point and that's in circulation now. When will that likely come before to the Board of County Commissioners? Well, I would say uh, certainly after you and your council have reviewed it uh, at your at your convenience. So it will be ready very soon, I would say. Mr. Spohr, on the uh, the bonds, as I recall in the past, but when you use the Port Authority, and I may be wrong, Andy's here as well, Andy Kuchka, but doesn't the Port Authority issue the bonds? You said the City of Milford is going to issue the bonds. It, it could be uh, either way. Okay. Um, the city of Milford has, has chosen to issue the bonds uh, and they will use the revenues, what are called non-tax revenues, to pay the debt service on those bonds. The bonds will be used to acquire the real estate and some public infrastructure relating to it. Uh, the debt service will be from non-tax revenues, the primary source of which is the 1% tax but also other uh, revenues and the team will also be purchasing some of the bonds so that to the extent the anticipated revenues are not sufficient to pay debt service on the bonds the team will be picking up the the difference okay. uh, the the port authority uh, may be asked to issue bonds for the uh, actual facilities themselves as opposed to the land. It really depends on negotiations with the port. Uh, we may be asking them to issue bonds as well, but that would be for the, the team's facilities and the team would, would be behind those bonds with lease payments. Good. 
Devil's in the details. We need to see the details. Yes, uh, details, weeds, whatever you're going to call them. But yes, definitely. And of course, everybody will have a chance to review them, and they'll be discussed publicly. So, good. Okay. I know we plan to have a public hearing uh, before we make a decision. So, sure. Yep. Yeah. Question for Michael Dawes: Do you think that we can? Um, Get a liquor permit so that Jeff can entice Ryan Geist to have an annex out here in Claremont County. Actually, I think uh, Jim Comodeca knows how to get the liquor permit. I'll actually answer that, that before, and, yeah. and I definitely have my Milford hat on. We have an excellent microbrewery already in existence in Milford, so the Little Miami Brewing Company. So that's true. Let's expand those folks. True. True. <laughs> Good job. <clears throat> so is that? complete the presentation <clears throat> before we leave that mr. Spore, you talked about that the bonds to be issued by the city of Milford and that those bonds would be serviced with non-tax um, debt revenues um, and, and then you talked about the team buying back some of that debt um, anything you can expound on that is that um, is that a buyback through the Lidner Foundation as the owner of FC Cincinnati or it would it would really depend on how the the ownership wishes to do it. My guess is it would be the actual team entity itself because that is comprised of not only the Lindner family but a number of other investors. So they would be uh, sharing in that uh, obligation, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I'd, um, I'd also like to thank, uh, simply because it's taken us five years to get here, as Jeff knows, uh, when we started off at Starbucks and Eastgate, in 2012 with Chris Smith um, and uh, creating the uh, King's Hammer over at the Red Barn property. Um, um, so I appreciate everything you've done, Jeff, and getting it here as well as uh, Carl Linder and George uh, Joseph for their um, involvement in getting the MLS team here for everybody in Cincinnati, which is awesome. Um, it'll be a, a great uh, uh, tribute uh, as well but um, I would also like uh, commissioners I'd like to get some form of letter from the trustees in Union Township and Miami Township as well as their state representative uh, who last year went on record saying they didn't like us to impose the 1% tax and very thing very few things have changed during that time but uh, I would like to see that their um, they're on board as well last year i said that i wouldn't do anything without asking them first so i would like to get a letter from um, union township trustees as well as uh, the um, miami township trustees and their state rep to say that uh, they're in favor of this as well because almost all of our 11 hotels are in union township and in, in miami township so i think that's a courtesy and i'm um, I very much want to thank uh, Nick Baker for his support at Holiday Inn, as well as um, uh, Mark Simons over at Homewood Suites and their support. So that's all I have. Anything else? That's it. I have nothing else. Uh, so I've said that we'll have a par public participation. Uh, during this time, the board does not answer questions or engage in debate. No member of the public may comment about a matter that is not within the purview of the county commissioner's responsibility. Commissioners are not expected to comment on matters brought before the board during this time. Each speaker shall speak only once and shall be recognized by the board president. In accordance with the board's rules of procedure, your comments are limited to five minutes, but I'd ask you to keep them to two if you can because we have a, lot of, a large audience here. So. With that, does anyone wish to speak to us today as part of public participation? Right Mr. Hicks? Oak? <clears throat> Please state your name and address. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, um, good morning. My name is Louis Salamini. I'm an attorney at Thompson Hine and I represent Cincy Sports Nation, um, a uh, local Claremont County business. And I appreciate the, the uh, opportunity to speak. I'm not sure I can finish in two minutes. I'd plan for five, but I'll talk as fast as I possibly okay. can. Thank you. So Cincinnati Sports Nation is a multi-sport and recreational facility <clears throat> and a Claremont County taxpayer and employer that's located at 5999 Meyer Drive in um, 
Milford, only four miles away from Expressway Park. Let me just pause. It's in Miami Township. It's got a Milford zip code, but it's in Miami Township. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I used to be a township trustee in Miami. so That is true. So the current owners uh, acquired the facility after it had been abandoned by a tire discounter and who moved out of the county. They bought it about a year ago and spent much of the last year of their hard-earned money and time and effort renovating that facility and opened it in June, uh, November 1, 2017. And since then, they've turned it in a beautiful facility, and it's literally projected to attract hundreds of thousands of patrons, visitors, spenders um, from both Claremont County and outside of Claremont County every year, and that's expected to continue. Now, I think we can all agree that governments shouldn't pick winners and losers in the marketplace. And that's especially true when you're speaking about a well-funded um, team uh, uh, taxpayer like uh, FC Cincinnati, business like FC Cincinnati, which is owned by people of very substantial means, and a company, on the other hand, like Cincinnati Sports Nation, which is owned by ordinary people, ordinary owners, many of whom are in the audience this morning, who have spent a significant portion of their personal life savings in making this business successful, and they want to keep it to be successful. Now, we've heard this morning, notwithstanding that government shouldn't pick winners and losers, that Claremont County, understandably, is prepared to make some powerful incentives, to offer some powerful incentives to attract FC Cincinnati to Claremont County. And we understand the benefits of that. That's not an uncommon thing to do. The glamour, the attraction, the notoriety, the excitement of a professional sports franchise is something that uh, every county in the United States uh, would aspire to. However, in the process, what we don't want and we don't think would be fair is as a result of these incentives, these subsidies, I hear there's the, the land would be apparently uh, available to FC Cincinnati for virtually nothing. I'm sure they won't be paying any real estate taxes. Apparently, they mer there may be bonds issued. We don't want to, we don't think it would be fair to turn a collaborator, when I say collaborator, I mean someone that we all want to collaborate with and, and uh, Cincy Sports Nation wants to collaborate with FC Cincinnati. It could be very, there could be synergies here. The, the uh, FC Cincinnati might make use of their facilities on occasion. We don't want a, co a collaborator to become a government subsidized competitor. That would not be fair. So. What we are asking to what we're asking today is some very simple things. We are asking that FC Cincinnati and Cincy Sport Nation be permitted and, and, and to live in harmony. And that's, a, that's an easy thing to do. And the way that can be done is to get assurances, and we're asking FC Cincinnati for those assurances this morning, that they will not install any bubbles over their practice fields, number one. Number two, that they will not build and install an indoor turf field. And number three, they won't rent their facilities to the general public. Now, as long as those three things don't happen, we'll, have, we'll live in harmony, we'll be in collaboration with FC Cincinnati, we won't be faced with the possible devastating consequences of trying to compete with a government subsidized competitor. So, what we ask then the county commissioners to do um, we ask for those assurances from FC Cincinnati, but we also ask the county commissioners in connection with any agreements they enter into, any leases, any bonds that might be issued, that these requests, these simple requests, be incorporated into any sorts of agreements that might be entered into with FC Cincinnati to be sure that in the process of this wonderful parade coming down the street of this new welcome citizen of Claremont County, that an existing business, an existing citizen, an existing taxpayer, an existing employer isn't trampled in the process and forgotten. So in a nutshell, that's what we're asking. I will also make one final remark, and that is um, when we learned that there would likely be these incentives offered, this going back months now, in the press, um, Cincinnati Sports Nation went and, uh, and made an effort to perhaps um, get some sort of also tax, real estate tax abatement that would be put it on an equal footing, if you will, with FC Cincinnati, level the playing field, level, level the soccer playing field, if I may say. Um, and they were discouraged from doing that on the grounds, as you might expect, well, you're already here. There's no reason to try to incentivize you to come to Claremont County because you're already here. But we're going to revisit that, and if we decide to revisit that request, we would hope the county would support us. 
But the main thing here is we want to live in happy harmony with FC Cincinnati. We don't want to be competing with FC Cincinnati given all of the helping hand that the county is providing it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address the board? Mr. Hicks? Thank you, Commissioner Humphrey. I'm Chris Hicks from 444 Woodwood Court, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45255. Um, I think one thing that has changed from before is I want to take my hats off to City Manager Michael Doss of Milford and even Jeff Birding, who after the presentation last night, I had a chance to talk with a little bit, and I felt both of them really were going the extra distance to sincerely answer questions. And the presentation today, at least st starting to talk about bond issuance and so forth and break it down, I have much more confidence that we can have an open process. That's the thing that I think is very important for the citizens of Claremont County. This is a major strategic change for our county. And it needs to be an open process where people have uh, input in it. So, but I want to offer my hats off, um, and, and especially for the sincerity and how long people stayed after the meeting last night willing to entertain questions. A lot of those answers probably should be in the presentation uh, versus in those side things. But it sounds, everything is awesome, right? $30 million, uh, World Cup, uh, I wrote these down, uh, in international media, massive hotel room nights, massive economic impact. We even know that people are going to spend $7.14 on transportation charges when they're here. It's amazing. But there's not a lot that we're learning about what the actual debt is, what the actual tax per obligations are, what could bite us in the rear end. Today I heard more about, well, we might need the port to issue bonds on the facility. Last night I heard about the Milford CIC and bonds on the land. This all needs to be in the open. It needs to be clear for everybody and every taxpayer in Claremont County what's happening here. Because I don't see a lot of detail on the actual debt, on the actual property cost, on how the tax dollars will actually be used. Infrastructure needs around the facility, nothing about that. Nothing about the services impact that may be required, police, fire, other things to support the additional facility or the impact on residents. Those are all important considerations too. And we shouldn't rush, we shouldn't rush, although by the way, most of my friends are huge FC Cincinnati fans, okay, so I have, I'm, they're constantly talking about how great FC Cincinnati is, but we shouldn't rush to do things without understanding exactly what we're getting into. It makes it sound too simple to say, boy, if you just give us this shiny 1% hotel tax, <laughs> utopia. $30 million, international media, everything's great. Maybe that's the case, but I think there might be more things that we need to make sure that you gentlemen Milford and the citizens who all have a stake in this are, are uh, involved in. One of the things that I think is interesting about this is I'm not sure how it's going to work. I went last night and looked at the legislation. The legislation says the Convention and Visitors Bureau has to have a contract for construction, improvement, or maintenance of a professional sports facility. It also says that professional sports facility needs to be on land that was purchased using the hotel tax. It also says that part of the hotel tax needs to be used for promotion of travel and tourism to the professional sports facility. I don't know how that becomes just we're going to use the 1% to service bonds on the land purchase. It just seems complicated. It almost seems like the way, as we know, the legislation in the budget last year was done la at the last minute in the dark of the night with no public input, and it's almost like the way it was worded. I said it back then. I'll say it now. The way that legislation is worded for activating the tax is a thin needle. It's putting a camel through the eye of a needle for the way it describes it. Additionally, the CVB, I hope most people know, replaced their Articles of Incorporation last year in October of 2017. In those articles, it goes on and on about how they can only be involved in things for the common good, for the common good. And it specifically enjoins them from being involved in activities that are for personal or individual benefit for personal or individual benefit. I'd say even when the CVB is paying for studies for one enterprise, that's for one person, not common good. So we need to look at that and we need to understand. At the bottom line, I really appreciated the, I'm a small business guy, I appreciated the Cincy Sports Nation guy talking about fairness, about fairness, and it's hard to compete with, with subsidized competitors. Another thing that's hard that I'd add to the request that he made, which I thought were a great request, Probably there might be other people that have soccer facilities that would have similar requests in this area is this can't be what it has been. Using the CVB as an arm of economic development for the county that maintains that it's not required to be transparent at all with the citizens with our tax money. 
And make no mistake about it, just like if somebody comes from Anderson Township and, and spends at Jungle Gyms in Union Township, once that money is in the Treasury, it's our money. It's Claremont County's money. Okay? If somebody comes from someplace else and stays in a hotel, once it's in the Treasury, it's our money. So that taxpayer money is being used to subsidize a private business in what we're talking about here. It is high time, and I would ask you guys, you've resisted doing it again and again and again, but to stipulate in whatever you do that our CVB has to be transparent. It should be transparent going back to already, all the way to 2012, Mr. Ubel, when you said when you first sat down working on King's Hammer. We should know where the money's going. We should know what's going on, who's getting rich, who's getting paid, how much we're paying for these studies that are telling us that we're going to spend, people are going to spend $7.14 on transportation. That's a very precise number. It's a very precise number. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity, and I really appreciate last night, I was, and I even here today with the presentations made, that we could have a spirit of openness and transparency. I think what the Cincy Sports Nation gentleman said were great points, but I also think it is high time. It is high time. Mr. Bloom, why doesn't the CVB just, it's bored. Nick Baker's here, just vote to be transparent. You can do it anytime you want. Instead, you're spending taxpayer money to fight in court to prevent taxpayers from seeing where money gets spent so that's Mr. tax Hicks, dollars. Mr. Hicks, your dialogue is with the board. It's not with members of the audience, so please stick to that. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're all together in an economic development project here. Okay. We all came in different boats. I, saw, I saw this quote from Martin Luther King. We all came in different boats, but we're in the same ship now. Okay. So this is a collaborative project that involves all of these elements. I appreciate the chance to make these remarks. Thank you, Commissioner Humphrey, and I hope you'll consider these points. And let's please do what this gentleman said or something like it, and let's please make our CVB be transparent. Thank you, guys. Comments? Anyone else want to comment? Two more? And, and more, if you wish to have more. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is Matt Van Sant, President of the Chamber of Commerce here in Claremont County. Uh, this is a great day for Claremont County. And before I begin my remarks, I should disclose I am a season ticket holder with FC Cincinnati, uh, Section 121, Row 32, Seats 1 and 2, and have been for uh, a few years now. Um, Clement County has had a long, rich history that goes back for decades of supporting important economic development programs and has been very, um, uh, very consistent in its support of projects uh, that bring dollars in from outside this county. Uh, we have used tax exemptions and other uh, means of public finance to make projects work. And I think in this case, with the details that we do have in front of us, that this is a different project than we all looked at a couple years ago. And I think Nick Baker will talk about that. Uh, so I just want to let uh, the board know that the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce is supportive of the uh, selection of uh, the C. Milford and Claremont County for this project. Uh, we think the use of the 1% uh, increase to the a lodging tax is, tax is important to make this project work. Um, this board may recall that uh, about 15 years ago, the Chamber of Commerce was supportive of an increase uh, to the transfer tax uh, to generate resources that eventually were used for the formation of Ivy Point in Union Township for the redevelopment in part of the Ford plant. And then more recently, the Chamber of Commerce was supportive of an increase to the a license plate fee of five dollars uh, provided that those resources were directed towards our transportation problems here in Claremont County. Uh, it's not usually a good feeling to talk about raising taxes but in a case like this and with the proposal before us uh, we think that the increase in lodging tax is appropriate at this time for this project and uh, wish uh, and hope that the board will take favorable action for this worthwhile project. Uh, with me is Nick Baker. Uh, I think Nick has yeah. uh, had written support. Go ahead, Nick. I did. I won't, I won't read the letter, but I'll just, you know, touch on a few points. Nick Baker, 1195, you need to drive, Milford, Ohio, 45150. Um, as Matt had said, I think this is a different plan than two years ago. Um, as some of you know, I was not in support of the plan two years ago, but I am now. Um, there's a plan in place. We know what we're doing with the lodging tax. We've seen what the impact is going to be. It's a better location. I love Milford. I've got three kids. I couldn't think of anything better to be in our backyard. This is going to be a huge thing, not only for, you know, the hotels, but it's also going to be a huge thing for Milford. Um, you know, I want to touch, you know, on with the Cincy Barn. I don't want to, it, we're never competing against one another. 
what's good for FC Cincinnati is good for you guys. The more teams we can get, the bigger tournaments we can get, the better. You know, that right now we're struggling with hotels working with one another, um, complexes working with one another. We need everyone to work with one another so we can get these 50, 60 team tournaments that are going to last a week. So I don't see it as in, you know, competing. I think we all need to be a county. We all need to work together. You know, what's good for you guys is going to be good for SC Cincinnati. You know, if they're having a tournament, you guys are going to have, um, you know, some teams there, get some um, attractions and vice versa. So, um, you know, the hotels need to work together. You know, we need to open up our arms. I'd also go back and say that that lodging per person that's underrated. I mean, I want to say it's about 130 to 150 per room per night that these teams are paying. So it's a premium. Um, you know, this market has kind of gone down, and I think this is the rejuvenation that we need um, in this area. Uh, there's not enough places that are working together, and we need everyone to work together to get this, you know, as great as it can be. Um, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for, you know, my hotel, my, my family, the county, and everyone involved. Um, you know, and I'd love to see it get passed. I think, you know, we got a great plan in place, um, and it's going to be one that's beneficial for all parties involved. So, um, you know, thank you, everyone, and, you know, let's get this passed and let's work together. You know, what's good for you is good for me, and what's good for me is good for you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us? Uh, I'm going to take a brief recess to allow you to leave the anyone that wishes to to leave uh, and then we'll start back up with uh, Linda Fraley uh, with the auditor giving us a financial audit report so we'll take a brief recess Okay, I think we're ready to get back into session here we'll call the meeting back into order and we have Linda Fraley Claremont County auditor uh, the Auditor of State's Annual Financial Audit of Claremont County Basic Financial Statements for the calendar year 2017, uh, 2017 pursuant to Chapter 117 of the I Revised Code. Ms. Fraley. Hard act to follow, guys. And I appreciate you. <laughs> I mean, I had to pay these people to stay. I don't know whether that's ethical or not, uh, but they, you know, I said I'd buy lunch or whatever. No. There you go. <laughs> But uh, that. it was buy lunch. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a buy lunch. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I uh, it was kind of funny because my daughter worked with the gentleman from KMK, and my son-in-law worked from the guy from Thompson Hines. So I got to uh, get them up to date. But um, but yeah, it's a it is a, a very hard act to follow in some ways. But I feel like my presentation is very well timed as far as uh, we're coming off a very positive meeting. And, and I feel like my presentation is also a very positive thing for Claremont County. Um, I know as the accountant, and I'm used to this, as the accounting, it's not exciting stuff. I don't have pretty pictures of the building and stuff like that. But as most everybody knows, and I know you, the county commissioners, really have an appreciation for, for the foundation that our accounting provides for your decision making. And also, so, so I just wanted to let you know that um, without the help of every elected official and the department in this county, we would not be successful in preparing our comprehensive annual financial report. And also, as stated by the auditor state, a very clean audit. Their audit found that our financial statements present fairly the financial position of Claremont County which I think it's a very good financial position, not just fairly, but it's a good financial position. And they also the Auditor State reviews the internal controls and the compliance of the county. And that's very important, as I stated at an earlier meeting, those internal controls are there as we try to protect the citizens and to, and to catch the things so we don't, don't have that. There was no material control weaknesses and there was no compliance uh, non-compliance with the federal, state, and local laws. Many of the citizens don't realize that our funding comes down through the state and, and federal, and all that money that comes down, they have regulations of how it's going to be spent. Sometimes those regulations are very complicated. And if you don't comply, then the funding, the partnerships with the state and federal don't happen. And so we, we're, when we're in, in compliance with their rules, that makes, makes it good for the next time we have a partnership. And so 
to those departments and those people that are out there working with us. Sometimes we ask you to have something in a, in a certain format or reject something in a certain way. I think that this is the time I have to say thank you for cooperation, but also make you realize that this is what it's about, that we're putting a good picture to outside people of how we take taxpayers' dollars seriously and, pre and present that, that fairly presentation. We received um, several awards from the Ottawa State with distinction, and part of that reward, that, that award uh, is, is that we have a clean audit and we also prepare that comprehensive uh, financial statement. And we feel like with what's come out in this audit that we will, uh, will sh should receive that award later on uh, because of that, because part of those rewards that, that there's a timely financial report, there's no findings for recovery, material citations, material weaknesses, there's no management level comments, and there's no other financial or other concerns. So from that, I am very proud um, to represent citizens of Claremont County and also present you, uh, Board of County Commissioners, that because it's, it's we prepare it, but we prepare it for the county, and I, we give you guys the credit also. And, uh, and this report is, is online. Um, it's on our website. Um, I know some of the times from years past, we had quite a large printing bill that we paid, and we, we printed all this stuff. We did a CAFR and a PAFR, but technology has allowed that, and I think that most of our citizens are very much aware, because I can tell the hits on our website that they do do that. Um, but they are on our website. There's a financial statement tab, and, uh, and you can go to that. And everything that I have just said here today is on and available to every citizen. And I want to thank you again for your time. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Linda, we appreciate the auditor's office. And for those who are here today that, that work for your office, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the hard work that you do. And, you know, I can tell you that from my years on the federal side of the house, the information that you have here and the accessibility and the ability to drill down through the MUNIS system is, you know, excellent. We, we had lots of spreadsheets, we had lots of reports, but we didn't have the ability to go right down and look at the check. So I, my hat's off to you, you know, excellent audit and excellent job. And that is true because the reports coming out, and we're looking at 1231 right now, but people want that. There's information on what happened last week. There's what happened what yesterday. And I, I thank you, uh, Commissioner, because I do want to thank uh, Chris Melman, Tina Williams, and Jennifer Hartley, who I think they're you know, second to none as far as quality people. And I, 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 I want to give them the credit for um, how, what they do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have the county engineer. 2017 annual report of roads, bridges, and culverts in Claremont County pursuant to uh, section 55543.2 of the Ohio Revised Code. Good morning. Greetings. Good morning. Uh, Pat Bunger wishes to extend his apologies. He's got a plumbing emergency at home. So I am filling in at the last minute and I'll do the best I can. Lucky you didn't get sent there to do the plumbing. I would have rather been over there to do the plumbing. <laughs> Um, annually required to do uh, uh, annual report. Uh, we've, here it is. I think you guys, do you guys all have one up there? Yep. All right. I think there's some back there as well. So I'm not going to, I'm going to be fairly brief, um, kind of go through here and get, give you some of the highlights. Um, Pat's got an introduction here, of course, it explains some of the, the overviews of our office. Uh, he also goes through what, what our office functions are, the administration, finance, construction, inspection, engineering operations tax map um, these are all different things that our uh, the staff at our office does um, getting the meat of it road and bridge and culvert conditions which is the actual uh, report of our or the condition of our, our infrastructure uh, road condition report we have about 385 miles of road um, and that's a center line miles uh, of that the average rating of those is a 65 and that 65 is out of 100 uh, just for just for some reference, the, the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio considers a 65 and below needing resurfaced, and our average is 65. So roughly half of our roads are in need of resurfacing. Um, that's not that's not new to us, but it, as we've discussed in the past past months and past years, is it's getting worse. But hopefully we can we've we've turned a corner with the, the some of the recent uh, decisions that have been made. 
uh, our bridge condition report. We've got roughly 418 bridges. Um, we've got some stats here. Um, a bridge is typically, you know, lasts about 50 years. 45 of those bridges are under the load limit, which is a 40 ton. Um, in the last uh, roughly 17 years, we've replaced, replaced 142 bridges. Um, 186, bridges of our, were, 186 of our bridges were built before 1968, which means half of them are over 50 years old already, or 186 of them are over 50 years old. Our culvert condition report, uh, culvert is a, uh, as a definition or a culvert is uh, any pipe that goes underneath the road that's less than 10 foot in diameter. Um, we've got almost 3,000 of those that we maintain. Uh, there's probably another 3,000 storm sewer pipes, pipes that run parallel to the road, maybe not necessarily under the road, but on the side of the road as part of our uh, improvement projects that we have. We've put a lot of storm sewer in. Um, average condition rating of those 3,000 culverts is a 6 out of a 10, um, which is fairly good. We, we are fairly active in replacing culverts. Um, every time we do our, our uh, road resurfacing annually, we go out and we repair, replace culverts that need re replaced, and, uh, and, and that keeps our culvert to, culverts in pretty good condition. As far as our, our funding goes, our, our capital improvement projects go, we spent roughly $2.2 .2 million last year on road projects. The bulk of that was our road resurfacing program, along with a couple of landslide programs. Uh, $1.5 million on bridge projects. And nearly a million dollars on new equipment purchases. So we've invested nearly $4.6 million last year in capital improvements. And of that $4.6 million, it's worth noting that we one point, roughly 1.7 1 of that came from uh, grants. So um, th that's a 37% that's a uh, match that we didn't have to use our local resources for. Our county maintenance program is basically our, our uh, County crews, we have roughly 40 people down over. The, we call them down over the hill. They're down from Filiger Road. Um, they they do everything from. You can see that there's like nine categories here. They do everything from maintaining our bridges, maintaining the roads, ditching, putting guardrail up, mowing potholes, snow and ice removal. Um, we've kind of listed the man hours here. It's kind of interesting to look at some of them. I was reviewing them and look at mowing, and we spent almost 9,000 hours a year mowing mowing our county roads. So you can figure if we've got 400 miles of road, that's center line miles, that's 800 miles of road, edge of road that needs to, needs to be mowed. Now some people mow their own yards, so we don't have to take care of those. But uh, this, we spend a lot of time mowing, um, a lot of time maintaining our, uh, our uh, bridges, potholes, almost 6,000 hours filling potholes in. So that's our county maintenance. Our financials, we'll go into the actual, some of the projects. Uh, last year we did about 11, resurfaced about 11 roads, which is a little over 20 miles at a cost of almost $2 million. Um, distant perspective, that's, we typically spend about a million dollars. Like I said, we had some grants last year, so that enables us to spend a little bit more. Uh, the year before was an even larger year, it was roughly $4 million. Landslides, we, we spent about a quarter million dollars on a couple landslides that, that occurred. And we also replaced uh, a dozen bridges this last year with a cost of about $1.5 million. Our revenues, our total revenue last year was about $10.8 million. Uh, Seven million of it came from vehicle license fees, uh, roughly two million from the fuel, fuel tax, and then uh, some miscellaneous, miscellaneous areas that we get our funding from. Our expenses, uh, we got the pie chart. That's kind of what we've, what we've already talked about, you know, what we've spent on our road program, bridge program. Our 2018 proposed capital improvement. Uh, we do have a our road resurfacing project. It's actually on the agenda for today. We've got 10 roads on there, about 23 miles of road at a cost of about $600,000. Um, it's worth noting that the, this is not 23 miles of resurfacing, it's 23 miles of road repair. Um, we're, we're actually resurfacing about two and a half miles this year because we've had some big programs in the last couple years. Um, the other work that we're doing this year is uh, repairing roads. Basically, if you see potholes, uh, we're actually going to contract a lot of that work out in preparation of resurfacing for next year. So we're, we're in preparation of some large resurfacing programs that we have coming up in the future years, we're going to 
try to get a lot of work done on our roads the year before, two years before. So if you see you know, some major work being done on a road, whether it be berming, um, some major pothole repairs, culvert replacements, that's a good indication that in the next year or two our roads can be resurfaced. So that's kind of what the, our, the bulk of our program is this year, is getting ready for next year. Um, also have a couple landslides we have planned this year. Um, one of the reasons, another reason our, our resurfacing is a little bit lower this year is our bridge program. We've got about uh, $2.6 million that we're spending this year on uh, nine bridges. Uh, that's a little bit higher than normal, so um, it's kind of taken away. We've got to kind of list our priorities one way or the other. So. Um, last page is basically partnerships. Probably is not mentioned enough when we talk about our county engineer's office, but the TID that the county engineer cooperates with uh, is responsible for a lot of projects. I mean, just last year in 2017, we managed uh, $20 million worth of projects. Um, the county engineer's office did in cooperation with the TID. Um, this year alone, we've got, a, we've got another couple active projects going on currently, uh, Branch of Guinea and uh, State Route 32 at Bells Lane project. Those are actively going on right now that the County Engineer's Office is maintaining or managing for the TID. Um, that is all I have for the end report. If you guys have any questions, I'm feel free to ask. Questions? On page four, there's a picture of Pat. Is that about 15 years old? Or? <laughs> yeah, I think he mentioned that last, I think he mentioned that last time that he needs to update his picture. He still hasn't updated his picture. Thanks, Doug. We all like to feel young, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the next is uh, consent agenda. Consent agenda was no. Mr. Alfred. Yes. Uh, you may want to consider public participation for any individuals who'd like to comment on the other two presentations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone that wishes to comment on the other two presentations that we've had? Public participation? We already approved the minutes. Was that earlier? Okay. Yeah. And we need to, you're, you're right, we need to go back up and approve Perfect the minutes. Minute. Yes. Uh, we have minutes of uh, June the 25th minutes. Do we have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. I'll second the motion. Painter? Yes. Shubel? Yes. Shubel. Aye. Next is consent agenda. Yep. Correct? Okay. We have a consent agenda. It was prepared for us and mailed out on Friday. Do we have any items that we need to pull from that agenda for further discussion and consideration? Or may I obtain a motion to approve the consent agenda as prepared? I'll make a motion for the uh, consent agenda as shown. Second. Yes. Yes. Aye. Uh, we'll skip over to page five, item six. We have a resolution 107-18 uh, in payment of bills. And the amount is $1,906,794.10. Do we have a motion to pay our bills and pass resolution 107-18? So moved. I'll second the motion. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Aye. Item seven. There you are. Representing Mr. Kiskaden. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Dominic Dalton. I'm a program administrator for the Clement County Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Dominic. And I'm here on behalf of the purchase of our new 911 phone system. A recommendation of John F. Cascaden, Director, Department of Public Safety Services, with the concurrence of Thomas J. Igel, County Administrator, to accept the proposal with Motorola Solutions, Schaumburg, Illinois, and to authorize Edwin H. Humphrey, President of the Board of County Commissioners, to execute the communication system agreement for the CallWorks NG911 system. Pursuant to and in compliance with the terms and conditions set forth therein, effective upon execution for a period of 10 years, and the total amount of $874,755.28, and contingent upon the release of the required <coughs> purchase order. Dominic, is that, a, um, is that the software? What is it actually that will <clears throat> it will actually be the software and all new equipment so uh, the first year 
Uh, our upfront price for the software and all of the equipment is three hundred and twenty-three thousand four hundred eighty-one forty-nine. And then year two through ten is our maintenance agreement yearly, and that's where we get to the total of eight hundred and seventy-four thousand. Okay, great. Thank you. So this is basically our connections to nine one one coming into us. Cincinnati Bell has uh, informed us several months ago that they'll be ceasing their 911 service to us. So we had no choice other than to go out and purchase a new 911 system. So uh, the current 911 system is antiquated. It's hard to locate 911 callers. The system will have uh, an interface with something called Rapid SOS. And what that does is provides us with the GPS location of the cell phone. Will make it much easier for us to find 911 callers from cell phones. Actually, I heard yesterday Cincinnati didn't even have it, and they're in the process of getting that as well. Yeah, it's. I mean, if you use like Find My iPhone and it shows the exact dot where your phone's at, that's the technology that we'll have access to. Currently, it uses. The vendors aren't even putting that available to you. The Verizon's and AT and T. Uh, I just saw something that iPhones were going to do that with the next update 12, we'll be able to do that. So the so phones don't even tell you where they are, even though they're capable of it as it's yeah, currently currently the technology is what's called wireless phase two. So when we receive an I-01 call, we get is the cell tower address. So what we do is we send what's called a, a rebit out to the phone and it uses several cell towers and uses triangulation to get an estimate of where the caller's at, but you know that's not always accurate. So that, that's always been a difficult situation with a cell phone because right. you know it, it pings the closest cell phone tower that it's near, and you know then the call is relayed from there. So it it get the wireless phase two technology gets us close, but that rapid SOS accessing the GPS from their phone and being able to tell us you know within almost feet of where a caller is at is going to be just a major improvement to helping us get help to the public quicker. Okay. But this will, this <coughs> will communicate that information should it be available at the cell phone level so it will be ready. Right. Yep. We, will, we will get the rapid SOS information which is the GPS along with the phase two so we will act, have access to both sets of information and you know the majority of the time the rapid SOS is going to be what's most accurate. Okay. We have a motion to accept the proposal from Motorola and to execute the communication system agreement as contained in item 7. So moved. Second. Mr. Yuval? Yes. Mr. Painter? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Great step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Item 8. Good morning. Good morning. Two items for consideration. Um, Sherry Smar, Community and Economic Development. Item number eight is a recommendation of Andy Kutka, Director, Department of Community and Economic Development, with concurrence of Suki Sheets, Assistant County Administrator, to execute a professional service agreement between the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of Health of the Claremont County General Health District. Um, this is to administer the um, septic system rehabilitation finance program in concert with the community development block grant for fiscal year 2017. This is funded in an amount of $100,000 with compensation for the administration not to exceed $5,000 and is effective January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. This is pursuant to and in compliance with the terms and conditions sent forth and contingent upon the release of the required purchase order. Okay, do we have a motion to execute the professional service agreement that's contained in item 8? So moved. I'll second the motion. Mr. Painter? Yes. Mr. Yubel? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Item 9. Item 9 is a request to bid for serve or to bid for a project, um, project number 201604, relative to the City of Milford Riverside Park Improvement Project. This is in concert with the Community Development Block, block Grant for 2016. Pursuant to plans and specifications, therefore, and to authorize the clerk of the board to place a legal notice in the newspaper of general circulation on July 5th, 2018, bids will be received 2 p.m. local time on Thursday, July 19th, 2018, in the office of the Board of County Commissioners and will publicly be open and read aloud shortly thereafter. 
Do we have a motion to approve the request to advertise for bids as contained in item nine? So moved. Move. I'll second the motion. Mr. Painter? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? I'm Mr. sorry, Mr. Ubel? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Item 10. Thanks, Sharon. Item number 10 is a recommendation of Pat Munger, County Engineer, with concurrence of Tom Igle, County Administrator, to accept the 2017 annual report of Claremont County Roads, Bridges, and Culverts for the County of Claremont, Ohio, received on May 31st, 2018, pursuant to Section 5543.02 of the Ohio Revised Code. Okay, do we have a motion to accept the 2017 annual report as contained in item 10? So moved. Second. Mr. Ubel? Yes. Mr. Painter? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Item 11. 11 is a recommendation of Pat Munger, County Engineer, with concurrence of Tom Igle, County Administrator, to award the bid for project number RS-06-18 relative to the 2018 road resurfacing program located in various townships, pursuant to the specifications to John R. Jerson out of Cincinnati, Ohio, for the lowest and best bid received on May 31st, 2018, in the amount of $586,249.55, and to execute the contract relative thereto, pursuant to and compliance with the terms and conditions set forth therein and award of bid and continued upon release of the required purchase order. Okay, do we have a motion to award the bid is contained in item 11? So moved. I'll second the motion. Mr. Painter? Yes. Mr. Ubel? Yes. Mr. Aye. And item 12, Ms. Butler. Hello. Greetings. Greetings. My agenda item is in reference to the RFP that uh, we went out with, and um, it's for, uh, for new land records management system. So um, don't mention that picture, Mr. Ubel, on the website. Mine's 25 years old. <laughs> They'll think we're a well bunch of preserved people here. Anyway, um, huh, until they get here. Whoa. We would never do that. I hope you don't. Don't tell anybody. Oh, you just Amra. It. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, so when we went out, um, we received our proposals back on May 3rd. We received four. Um, one was not a consideration because it didn't meet the requirements. So we, we um, had three really good proposals. And with that, we came up with a uh, company that we'd like to do business with. So with that, I'll read my motion, and that's the recommendation of myself, Deborah Klepper, County Recorder, with the concurrence of Thomas Eigel, County Administrator, to accept the proposal for contracted services for a land records recording and records management system for Claremont County, submitted by Cofile Technologies from Dallas, Texas, on 5-3-2018, pursuant, pursuant to the specifications, therefore, and in concert with sections 307.86, 307.862 of the Ohio Revised Code, and to authorize Edwin Humphrey, President of the Board of County Commissioners, to execute the agreement for the re records management and imaging system by and between Claremont County, Ohio, and Cofile Technologies, which includes Schedule A, entitled the statement of work and includes the fees for the archive um, project number one and project number two and is which is an exhibit in which in which is co-file county fusions rfp response dated 5 3 2018 as well as qualifying statement that any conflict between the statement of work and the rfp that the statement of work shall govern accordingly with the term of the stated agreement for a period of five years with monthly payments at the negotiated rate of $3 per document and to commence upon the complete installation and, and document processing thereof, which in further identified as the go live date of 9-17-2018 pursuant to in compliance with the terms and conditions set forth therein and contingent upon the receipt of a revised certificate of liability insurance, which Judy, hopefully we have received, and, and the release of the purchase order in concert with the requisition number 
08-00, dated 6-25-2018. Do we have a motion to accept the proposal and to execute the agreement as contained in item 12? So moved. Second. I had a question, Debbie, on this. Sure. Um, so we're not actually buying this software or service. We're just paying a fee per record. And that's why we've always We are. And, and in the RFP, we wanted to lease to lease everything. So it's it's at the rate of a $3 per document processing fee. And in the past, what it Which was, is, yeah. um, what what did we pay? No, our, what well, did we, did we always do a lease in the past? We always had a lease system, yes, and uh, and paid more. So I believe that this that this new rate is, is real beneficial for all of us here, and it's gonna produce good product. What did we used to pay, approximately? When I came in, we were paying three, um, I think it was 345 per document, and then they reduced that to 334 um, at one point in time. Great, going in the right direction. We are. Good. We are. Any other questions? Yes. No, we have a motion and a second. Roll call. Yes. Hainer. Yes. yes. Aye. Item Thank 13. You. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Debbie. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Item 13 is a recommendation to adopt the annual tax budget for fiscal year 2019 and it will also authorize Commissioner Humphrey to execute the annual tax budget for fiscal year 2019. Okay, we have a motion to adopt the annual tax budget is contained in item 13. So moved. I'll second the motion. Shainer? Yes. Shubel? Yes. Humphrey? Aye. Item 14. Item 14 is a recommendation to adopt resolution 108-18, which resolves to authorize the transfer of approximately 18.539 acres, 2.011 acres, and 2.071 acres of real property. These are three pieces of property that are currently in the name of the Board of County Commissioners. They are being utilized and were purchased or donated to the county for the purposes of the developmental disabilities operation. So what we're gonna do is transfer these now that the Board of Developmental Disabilities can hold property, we're gonna go ahead and transfer these because they built the buildings that are on them, um, on both of them. One of them actually was donated with a deed restriction that says it has to be operated, continue to be operated as a developmental disabilities um, educational slash training type of activity. So there's three properties. One is located on US 50 and two of them are located on Armstrong Boulevard. Um, in, the first one being in Stone Lake Township and the other two in Batavia Township. Um, we will then transfer these to the Claremont County Board of Developmental Disabilities and execute the quit claim deeds, therefore, as prepared by the prosecuting attorney's office and any other documents necessary to convey the parcels and complete the recording of the transactions relative thereto. Okay, do we have a motion to adopt resolution 108-18 is contained in item 14? So moved. Second. Mr. Hubel? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. So, quick question. Do we have any other DD properties? Or is that the, are those the last three that, that we That is have? the last of the DD properties. Okay. Yes. Okay. Everything, the other properties that they have are in their name. Item 15? Item 15 are our financials for this week. First, we have in the general fund, Board of County Commissioners retirement payout account, $1,574.03 for sick pay at retirement. Um, then we have in the general fund, in the common pleas probation incentive award, regular salaries, $20,000, and related fringes, same area, for $6,000. This is a portion of the general fund that has a, had a, has a grant that came in and we, are, we track that through the uh, probation incentive uh, organization code. They are actually hiring another pretrial bond officer and they're gonna utilize these grants to pay for them uh, this year and going into next year, it's going to be a sharing between general fund and this uh, incentive award money. So what is the incentive? They receive incentives based on the, uh, their annual review of the state on how they perform for certain measures. They have key measures that they have to meet, you know, whether it's, I don't know if it's actually recidivism or, you know, there's multiple measurements that probation has to meet. Okay. So when they meet those, then they get this incentive award money and they're, they're allowed to utilize it for certain activities. 
So this one, the pretrial pre bond officer, is an allowable activity. Actually, it's it's almost unrestricted, but it's in contrast okay. with the grant application and the grant agreement that they've received, and it's a two-year uh, period of time, and they have certain um, criteria that they um, set forth, and they um, have exceeded it in both grant years that they've received it, and um, can utilize that money for um, other programs within um, or other uses within that particular um, category. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the supplement appropriations as contained in the item just read? So moved. I'll second the motion. Mr. Pena? Yes. Mr. Yuval? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Humphrey, we have three add ons. So, do okay. you want to stay up there or do you want to sit back yeah, down? Yeah, we'll, we'll keep you up there. You still want to up and down? You got it. I got it. Okay. First, I have an add-on uh, to recommend that the airport management agreement between the Board of County Commissioners and Eastern Cincinnati Aviation for the management of the Claremont County Airport that expires on June 30th this year be extended on a month-to-month -month basis that will commence July 1st under the same terms and conditions as set forth in that airport management agreement. We are working on negotiations with Eastern Cincinnati Aviation to redraft a 40-year-old agreement. Um, we aren't quite to the point where we can both agree on what needs to be in that. Um, so what we're going to try and do is maintain the current one on a month-to-month -month basis and get this hopefully done within the next 90 days. And so we will be back with a new agreement. Does this, does this include the 90 days or we're going to? It'll be on a month-to-month -month basis and the goal is to get it completed within 90 days. Okay. So we'll do three extensions. Okay. Adam, if the agreement is uh, negotiated and acceptable before the 90 days, we could just do 60 days, you know, two months on a month to month, and the third month will make it a, the new agreement effective. No way. Anyway. But there is a deadline of 90 I, days. We will be back, yes, okay. with an agreement before 90 days. We'll be back in 90 okay. days. So do we have a motion to approve the airport management agreement on a month to month basis for 90 days? So moved. Second. Mr. Yubel? Yes. Mr. Painter? Yes. Mr. Humphrey? Aye. Next. The next add-on is from the county sheriff, and it is to execute a rider for software subscription maintenance agreement uh, between the board on behalf of the sheriff and Power DMS. This is for the acquisition of subscription services for the management of documents, records, and data, as well as training as set forth in Exhibit A in the amount not to exceed $5,123.80, effective for the period of 7-3-18 through 7-2-2019. Okay, do we have a motion to execute the rider for software subscription maintenance agreement is contained in this add-on? So moved. I'll second. Mr. Painter? Yes. Yes. Aye. And the next item. We have something from the prosecuting attorney's office. Last but not least. Hi, good morning. Hi. Hi. Here on behalf of the prosecuting attorney for the 2018 and 2019 Victims of Crime Act uh, in the State Victim Assistance Act grant application for funding from the State of Ohio Office of the Attorney General for the continuation of the Claremont County Common Pleas Municipal and Juvenile Courts Advocate Program implemented, implemented by the prosecuting attorney. The recommendation of D. Vincent Ferris, prosecuting attorney, with the concurrence of Thomas J. Eigel, county administrator, to approve the electronic filing of the 1819 Victims of Crime in the State Act and the State Victims Assistance Act grant application for the funding from the State of Ohio Office of the Attorney General in Columbus, Ohio, for the continuation of the advocate program to provide and extend victim advocate services to the Claremont County Common Pleas, Municipal, and Juvenile Courts implemented by the prosecuting attorney in the amount of $193,442.70 with a required local cash match in the amount of $48,360.67 to be provided from the 2018-2019 annual appropriations for the prosecuting attorney for a total VOCA program amount of $241,803.37 and an amount of $6,586 for the SVAA grant with no local match required 
for a total amount of $248,389.37 for the advocate program for the period of October 1st, 2018 through September 30th, 2019, pursuant to and in compliance with the terms and conditions set forth. We have a motion to approve the electronic filing and the remainder of the add-on, this add-on. So moved. I'll second the motion. Mr. Painter. Yes. Mr. Yubel. Yes. Aye. We have a need for executive session, I believe. Is that our next item? Okay. We have a need for executive session pursuant to Section 121.22 G2 and G3 of the Ohio Revised Code to consider the sale of property at competitive bidding and two to confer with the prosecuting attorney regarding pending or imminent litigation respectively do we have a motion to go into executive session under those two sections so moved i'll second the motion mr painter yes um, mr aye. Hubel, mr humphrey aye we'll be back we're back from executive session. No decisions were made. Uh, I think we have time for public participation. Anyone wish to address us? If not, then I'll entertain a motion uh, to adjourn. So moved. I'll second the motion to adjourn. Okay, yes. Mr. Yes. Aye. That concludes our business for today. Thanks for joining us and God bless. <laughs>